Before we get there, I'm going to say something that perhaps you've never heard. I've heard a pastor say before. And it's just simply this. Um, there are times where God does things that, from my perspective, are just confusing. Well, I mean, there really, really are. And I think if we're all being honest this morning, whether you're here and, and you're from a church background and you've been in church all your life, or, or perhaps whether you're here and, man, this is your first time ever gathering with the church, um, the truth is that there have been times in all of our lives where we've looked, we've looked at, at something that has happened in our lives and we've wondered, um, God, I don't understand what in the world you're doing. You know, for instance, like 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 perhaps you know you've you've had you've had a marriage that has struggled, and, and man, you prayed and you prayed that that God would fix your marriage, and and not only did your marriage get worse, but man, it, it fell apart. It actually ended, and you wonder, God, what what in the world is going on here? What are you doing? Or perhaps you know your story has been, man, man, you 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 know children are a gift from God, um, but man, you wonder, man, God, if kids are a gift, then um. Man, why, why, why can't we seem to conceive? Or, or, or perhaps, well, why have we miscarried? Man, man, maybe that's your question. Or, or perhaps the question is, man, you, you've heard that God is a healer, and so you pray that God would heal you or heal somebody else, but, but man, the diagnosis got worse, or, or, or perhaps you lost somebody. Man, God, what in the world are you doing? And that's the whole idea behind the next six weeks as we jump into this series, God, what in the world are you doing? The fact is there are times from our perspective where God allows us to go things and it just confuses us. It perhaps discourages us. It perhaps is disappointing to us. And so what do we do when we're just confused by God? And where I want to start this series with is an idea that that's, that that's simple to say, but it is so hard to, to believe sometimes and so hard to put into practice. But the idea is this. When I'm confused by what God does, I'm not going to trust what I see. I'm going to trust what God says. I'm not going to trust what I think, what I feel, what things seem to be around me. I'm going to simply trust what God says. And, and here's where we get that. Romans 8, 28. The Holy Spirit speaking through Paul says this. And we know, somebody say we know. We know that in all things... Not some things, not most things, not, not many things, but we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know where your confusion is, but, but here's what I do know. When we wonder, God, what in the world are you doing? What God has said is, I know you may feel confused, and I know you may feel discouraged, and I know you may feel incredible pain right now, but I really am for you. I am working for your good. I'm working for your joy, and I'm calling you for my purposes. At the end of the day, even some of the worst things we've ever journeyed through will be shown to have been worked out for good by God. So what I want to do for just a moment is ask everybody to bow your head and close your eyes for just about 60 seconds. And I just want you to talk to the Lord about whatever that struggle is you're facing right now. If it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. And then I want you to ask your Heavenly Father to help you trust what He says more than what you see. And you guys take a few seconds to do that. And then I'll close this out in prayer in a second. We'll get into today's message. I'm thankful that we're here today. We're here to celebrate you. And we celebrate not just the fact that you died on the cross for our sin, and we celebrate not just your teachings. We celebrate you because you took the best shot death had to offer. You let death kill you, but then you defeated death by coming back to life three days later. And that's why we worship you. That's why our hope is in you, because the God that can defeat death which is the most insurmountable thing for us as human beings, 
If you can defeat death, Lord Jesus, and you did, then no situation is ever too far gone. No moment is ever hopeless. No space we can be in life is too far beyond your reach. Even in our most confusing moments, our most discouraged moments, our most disappointed moments, God, we choose to believe that you do in fact work all things out for your glory and for our good. And we believe it because you took the greatest act of injustice ever, the innocent, perfect, spotless Lamb of God being taken by sinful men and nailed to a cross, and you turned that into an empty tomb and made a way for us to have eternal life. Jesus, we celebrate that this morning. And I pray in light of that celebration, I pray you would do a deep work in our hearts today and over the next six weeks as we struggle with this very real question of God, what in the world are you doing? And I pray, Lord, that every single person under the sound of my voice, whether here in the room, whether watching online, whether watching on YouTube later in the week, Lord, I pray that we would come to see that the answer we're looking for, Jesus, is not necessarily in a certain situation, but it's in a person, and that person is you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Thank you for this moment. And ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All righty. Well, if you're new with us today, uh, my name's Dylan. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at LifeSpring. I want to especially welcome those of you who may, it's your first time here, uh, whether you're in the room, whether you're watching on Church Online, whether you're on YouTube later in the week. We are seriously honored uh, by the fact that you're here with us. And like Mark mentioned earlier uh, during our welcome, I would encourage you, man, don't, don't just be here today, uh, but, but be with us over the next six weeks because we're going to really wrestle with this question of, God, what in the world are you doing? Um, and I think it's going to be very meaningful. I think it's going to be very um, impactful in your life because the truth is all of us go through these seasons um, where we're confused and we have questions. And it is okay to have questions, guys. It is okay to have questions. We're a church where it is okay for you to ask questions. But the reason it's okay to ask questions is because uh, we believe there's answers. And those answers are not necessarily in a situation there in a person and his name is Jesus. And my hope and prayer over the next six weeks is that that is exactly what you discover, is that Jesus really is the answer. If you have a Bible and you want to follow along today, we are going to be in Mark chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, no worries. Everything will be on screen. And if you don't have a Bible because you don't own a Bible, uh, just drop by the Connection Center on the way out and you can get a free Bible. Um, All of us have been in situations, like we talked about during community time, if you were here for that, that are urgent. And when something is urgent, it has to be dealt with immediately. Right then, you cannot wait. So, for example, uh, two months and two days ago at 1047 at night, I was asleep, sound asleep. It was awesome sleep. You might say, how do you know you weren't even awake? Precisely. I wasn't awake. I wasn't aware that my wife was getting ready for bed. I didn't even hear my wife come to bed. I was that asleep. And considering my wife was 38 weeks pregnant at the time, then like the fact of getting sleep, good deep sleep is kind of a big deal because I knew sleep deprivation was coming. And so I'm out. I'm dead to the world. And then I hear my wife's voice, Dylan, And given the tone she said it and the fact that she was 38 weeks and two days pregnant, I knew exactly what that meant. And before my feet even hit the ground, I was like, has your water broken? And she's like, I think so. And so in that moment, man, we went into like DEFCON 3 or whatever. Like it was like urgent mode. We're calling my mom. We're calling uh, Nicole, who was going to watch my kid before my mom got there in the morning. Uh, We're calling the doctor. We're like, hey, what do we do? And they're like, well, if you think your water's broken, you need need to come in. And we're making sure we've got everything in the car. We had put together a checklist and we make sure we're checking everything off on that list. And we get in the car. Thankfully, labor was not painful at that point. And 12 hours to the minute that uh, my wife's water broke, Jaden entered the world. And they're actually here at church for the first time uh, since Jaden's been born. They're watching the mother baby room, which is really cool. So, but that was an urgent moment for me. And, and all of us have been in urgent moments. And when the urgent happens, you, you don't sit around and you're like, well, I think we should talk about this for a little bit. I think we should analyze this moment. I think we should study this. I think we should, we should break this apart into Greek and Hebrew and, to, and decide, is this actually an urgent moment. Maybe we should call a prayer meeting or a business meeting, God forbid, um, and discuss what exactly we should do. No, when urgent moments happen, you have to deal with them immediately. And every single one of us have been in those situations. It sounds like Pastor Mark was in some severely urgent situations. Um, On the back end, (laughs) pun intended, 
of his mission trip or whatever. Um, we've all been in urgent situations, and many of us find ourselves in those. And there's a man in Scripture in Mark chapter 5 named Jairus who found himself in perhaps the most urgent situation a person can ever find themselves in. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 21, here's how... Mark records it, um, or, or Mark were interviewing Peter and recounting Peter's recollection of this. It says, when Jesus had crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, that'll be important, named Jairus, came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Let's pause right there. One of the most urgent situations you can ever be in as a parent, and if you're a parent, you know this, is when your kid gets like really sick for the first time. Like they have a little cough, whatever, but like when they get real sick for the first time, it's kind of freaky. Like the first time Kaysen got real sick, he felt a little warm. We checked his temperature, it was 100. We're like, well, that's not great. And then we checked it an hour later, it was 103. That freaked me out. And if you're a parent, then, then you know what that's like when your kid is like really sick. Now, after that, like as they, they get a little older, you're like, you know, you're going to be fine. Just rub dirt on it. It'll be okay. But that first time they're sick, you, you, you kind of freak out. Um, but man, that's nothing compared to, man, my kid is dying. And man, maybe some of you guys have walked through that. Maybe you've lost a child, even if it was through miscarriage. Man, you like, like the, 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 the sense that, man... My kid is almost gone. Man, that's an urgent situation. And when there's urgency, what that brings us to is a couple things. That, that, that always leads us to, to, to great clarity as far as like what actually matters. And it also leads us to desperation. So, so here's how that plays out for Jairus. Jairus was a synagogue leader, and the synagogue leaders in that time, that they weren't exactly the biggest fans of Jesus. They didn't really care for Jesus. They thought he was an imposter, and even if he did miracles, they thought that he did miracles by the devil. And so Jesus wasn't really a guy they were interested in, and I don't think it's a stretch to say that there's probably a good chance that Jairus was a little skeptical about Jesus. But man, when his daughter's like on death's door... He's like, you know what? I, I, I don't care about that. I don't care what the opinions of my peers are. I'm not even sure that I care what my opinions are of Jesus or even how he does it. I've heard Jesus can heal. In fact, I'm pretty sure he can. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try him out. Because at the end of the day, what, what, what's important is not what other people think. What's important is not my opinion. What's important is not even my respectability. And we see that because he fell on his knees before Jesus. And Jewish men that were dignified did not fall on their knees before anybody. And yet Jairus does that. But when there's urgency, there's great clarity to him on what actually matters. And it's not the opinions of others. It's not his respectability. It's the fact that his little girl is dying. And so he's even willing to put aside what are most likely his own, his own prejudices against Jesus to say... I'm going to give Jesus a shot. And, and man, perhaps that's where you are this morning. Perhaps you're here and you're like, man, I'm not even sure that I buy the whole Jesus thing. I'm not even sure, sure what I believe. I'm pretty skeptical. But, um, but man, I, I just don't know where else to turn. And I just don't know what else to do. And I just don't know how else in the world to, to navigate this thing that I'm navigating. And so I'm going to at least give Jesus a try. Because life is urgent and you're desperate. And can I just say, man, one of the greatest gifts God can give us is the gift of desperation. Because when there's desperation, there's urgency, there's clarity. And we start to understand what's actually important. So Jairus goes to Jesus, this urgent situation. He says, my little daughter is dying. And then he goes on and says, would you please come and put your hands on her that she will be healed and live? And then it says, so Jesus went with him. And then the story gets very, very interesting. It says a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now, we don't have time to get into the story of the woman here. But, but it makes a very interesting side story to what happens here with Jairus. It says, she'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes... I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. Then watch this. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? In other words, he stopped. 
Now put yourself in Jairus' shoes here. My little daughter's dying. Jesus, you can heal her. We're on the way. We're going through the crowd. Jesus is like, hang on. Who touched me? And then the disciples feel like this is ridiculous. They're like, well, you see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered. But yet, yet you can ask who touched me. Then watch this. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Put yourself in Jairus' shoes in this moment. Doesn't this feel a little bit like an unnecessary delay? And none of us like unnecessary delays, right? Yeah, I mean, think about how frustrated you get in the following situation. Uh, you're at Walmart on the busiest day of the week, whatever day that happens to be. Um, or perhaps it's a special day and you've driven up to Crabtree Valley Mall and you're trying to find a parking place that, was, that you've got to get your big SUV in, even though the parking spaces were made for Model Ts. Um, and you're trying to get one close, right? Because, I mean, we live in a sedentary society. Who wants to walk the extra 300 feet, right? And so you're, you're spending like the 30 minutes to try to find the perfect parking space. And then you see it. You see somebody walk out. They get into their car. You're like, yes. You turn your turn signal on because that's the polite thing to do. You get up really close so that nobody else is going to get it. And then you see them turn the car on. And then they just sit there. <laughs> and they sit there. And they sit there. And now somebody's behind you and they're honking on your horn. And you're like, I'm trying to get a parking space. And finally you get so frustrated that you pull away after five minutes. And you then realize, well, if I parked 300 feet away, I could have already been in. And then after you pull away, you notice the person pulls out and somebody else gets your space. <laughs> been there, right? Nobody likes unnecessary delays. So we can relate to this. But this is on a much more serious scale than this. This is more like this. Say a loved one, like you're at Pizza Inn and you're with your spouse and your spouse has a heart attack. Perhaps not surprising if you're at Pizza Inn, right? I, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, heart attack, right? Um, and, and, and you're like, okay, well, we're going to call the ambulance. Johnson Health is right down the road and they're pulling in, but it's a Friday and it's lunchtime. And the ambulance driver's like, hey, it's lunchtime. Um, why don't we just go into Chick-fil-A and we'll go through the drive-thru, which is a minimum of a 30 minute commitment at the Smithfield drive-thru. Can we all agree we might in that situation be like, can you just give me the keys? Because this seems like a very unnecessary, like we're talking life and death here and you want a chicken sandwich. And then saying, so we can all agree this feels like a really unnecessary delay, right? It's like, Jesus, my girl is dying. And yes, somebody may have touched you. So what? Like, I've got this real problem here. I mean, some of you guys are in the same situation, right? Because maybe you guys have been in a situation, maybe you're navigating something you've navigated for weeks, for months, or years, and you're like, God, you need to do something now. Because this is desperate, this is urgent, and we can't have any delays. Put yourself in Jairus' shoes here. My little daughter, daughter is dying, and Jesus, you want to you do meet and greet? I think I, might, think, I think I might be a little stressed. I think I might be a little frustrated in the moment. And then Jairus goes on what well, only can possibly be a roller coaster of emotions here. Verse 33, it says, Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith is healed. You go in peace and be free from your suffering. Now, now that would be exciting, though, right? Because it's like, oh, well, Jesus did this for her. And man, she just touched him. I know he's going to take care of my daughter if we can just get there in time. And then verse 35 happens. It says, While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? What do you do when you just get disappointed by Jesus? But do you think Jairus might have felt disappointed by Jesus in this moment? Do you think he might have felt misled by Jesus? I mean, if I'm Jairus, I'm thinking, man, Jesus, you said you were going to help and you stopped in the crowd and and now my daughter's dead. What do you do when you get disappointed by Jesus? And, and I'm not saying this from like a hypothetical situation, guys. There have been moments in my life where, 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 I, where, where I feel like God has kind of like disappointed me in a lot of ways. And it made me wonder, God, what in the world are you doing? Like when my wife went through some, some significant digestive issues, couldn't keep hardly anything down, even water for like two years, and then all of a sudden her symptoms just went away. And they went away for like two months. And we're like, wow, God, you did something awesome. And then on my birthday, those symptoms come roaring back. I'm like, God, what the heck? 
Because I thought you'd taken care of this, and now it's obvious that you haven't. God, what in the world are you doing? Or perhaps when, when we got pregnant with our first child, and the day we're supposed to go hear the heartbeat for the first time, we instead go and hear that the, uh, the pregnancy is over. God, kids are supposed to be a gift. Why in the world would you let me navigate this? Or perhaps, you know, I, I, I've been through this so much as a pastor, like, you, we've, like a few years ago, it feels like, man, we're just starting to get momentum, we're starting to grow. And, and then a global pandemic shuts everything down. It's like, God, what in the world are you doing here? And it made me question my call, and it's like, man, am I even supposed to do this? I've even wondered, like, is some of the things that I've gone through and my wife has gone through, it's like, man, God, is this a function of me being in ministry? Because if this is a function of me being in ministry, I'm not even sure I want to be in ministry. So I've been there, guys, where I've felt let down by God, where I've been discouraged, where I've been like, God, did I miss you? And I've obviously just been really disappointed by Jesus. So, so don't think I'm talking here on like a theoretical level here. I'm talking about something I've wrestled with. I know some of you guys are wrestling with right now where you feel like God is taking you to a point and, and then just kind of let you down. What do you do when you're disappointed by Jesus? Well, the temptation is to do exactly what these people told Jairus. They're like, man, it's over. Your daughter's dead. Man, man, why even bother with Jesus anymore? And I've personally never been tempted to walk away from the faith, but, but I've been tempted to really question my calling. But man, for some of you, it's, man, why, why would I continue following a God who, who it, feels like, it feels like from my perspective, he's disappointed me. What do you do in that moment? Well, here's one of the most important things to realize, guys. In that moment, even when you feel disappointed by God, the truth of the matter is this. Jesus is still speaking in that moment. And Jesus speaks to Jairus here, verse 36. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. And, and, the, and the way that's actually written in Greek is just keep on Believing. In other words, Jairus, you came to me believing that I was the answer. You need to keep believing that I'm the answer. Now, now notice here, here's what's so important about this. Jesus didn't say, hey, it's okay, man, I'm going to take care of your daughter, no sweat. Jesus didn't promise him a certain outcome here. Jesus just promised himself. And that's the thing we need to understand, guys. Jesus isn't guaranteeing us a certain outcome here. But he does promise us himself. And he does promise that if we'll stick with him, he'll be with us right in the middle of it and all the way through it. And so the tension point, the question for many of us today is we wrestle with the question, God, what in the world are you doing? It's very simply, are you going to stick with the one that is the answer? Are you going to stick with the one who you believed was the answer or could be the answer? Or are you going to go try and find something else? Because here's the other thing, guys. There's literally no other option. There are no other answers. And you can try logic, and you can try science, and you can try reason, and you can try prep pleasure, and you can try whatever else you can put in the blank. No, here's the thing. Nothing else is going to fix the situation you're in. But the other thing is this. Jesus doesn't even promise to fix the situation you're in. But he does promise to walk with you through it. And he promises to redeem it. God works all things out for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So what do you do in that moment? Let's see what Jairus does here. Verse 37 says, Jesus didn't let anyone follow him except James and John and the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, well, that means is Jairus made a decision. He decided, I'm disappointed. I'm discouraged. I even feel like I'm kind of misled. But you know what? I'm going to take this crazy step and decide that perhaps Jesus really is the answer. I came to him thinking that maybe he's the answer. I'm going to stick with him and give him a shot. And so Jairus sticks with him, and that's so important. And then it says, when he went in, and then it says, Jesus went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. Now, if I'm Jairus, I don't think that I would have laughed. I think I would have slapped. It had been like, 
I feel like you're minimizing my pain, Jesus. And that's not funny, but because my daughter is dead and you're just saying she's sleeping, what in the world is going on here? Here's what we need to understand, guys. Jesus is not minimizing the problem here. But he is showing Jairus who he is. Because what Jesus is communicating to Jairus is this. Death is not death to the one whose life itself. What he's communicating to Jairus is, I see the problem differently than you do because I have a different perspective. And that's one of the most humbling things for us to understand, isn't it? That perhaps even in our frustration, perhaps even in our discouragement, perhaps even in our anger, if we can be honest, like God actually has a different perspective, a higher perspective. And he calls us to trust that. And you get this if you're a parent, right? Like, for instance, um, one of me and Kaysen's thing to do, Kaysen is my firstborn, uh, every Friday we go to the train station in Selma and we watch the trains because he loves trains and it's a lot of fun and that sort of stuff. Um, and so one afternoon, and he was just in a mood. Like, if you're a parent, ever, ever had your kid get, just get in a mood, right? Like, especially when they're about two years old, right? Like, 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 like that you can't reason with him. And so, like, we're about to go to the train station. I try to pick him up in his car and get him in his car seat. Two-year-olds have this weird thing that if you pick them up, it's like they can disconnect their shoulder blades and they and immediately put on, like, goo and become slippery. And, 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 he, and I try to put him in his car seat, and he just goes nuts. He's like, all done, all done, all done. And I'm like, no, you're going to sit here. And, he, and, and what he wanted to do was he wanted to go pat on the garage door. And it's like... And I got so frustrated, I almost didn't go, but I was like, no, no, he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't have the same perspective, and so I held him down and strapped him down, that sort of stuff. And we left, and he's screaming and squalling. Well, then we get to the train station, and he sees the train, and he's happy. And I explained something to him, and I don't know if he got it, but it made me feel better. Don't you do that as a parent sometimes, right? Like, you don't know if your kid gets it, but, like, you feel better for saying it. But I told him, I was like, son, well, when Daddy tells you to do something, like, you just need to trust me. Because I know you thought that the, he calls the garage door the thump on door because he goes and he thumps on the door. It, it's great. It's really cute. You thought the thump on door would be awesome, but I wanted you to see the train, which I know is like your favorite thing in the world. So you just needed to trust me instead of kicking and screaming and fussing because I have a different perspective than you. My perspective is I'm not ruining your fun. I'm taking you to something greater. See, that's the perspective God calls us to trust him with. And guys, that's tough because it requires us swallowing our pride. Because let's just be honest. When we get in these moments where we feel disappointed by Jesus, our attitude can very often be this. It's, God, if I was in your shoes, I would have done it differently. And we may not say that out loud, right? Because it sounds kind of arrogant. But that's often the way we approach it, right? It's, God, if I was in your shoes, I just would have done this differently. But Jesus wants us to see, no. Trust me, I've got a different perspective here. And I know this hurts in the moment, but if you'll trust me, if you'll keep on believing, you're going to see that I, you're going to see maybe not a different outcome, but you are going to see me. And that's actually what we need at the end of the day. And we'll talk about more about that in a second. But check out what happens here next. It says... After he put them all out, he took the child's father and the disciples who were with him, and, and he went into where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished, and he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. See, here's what was going on here. As Jairus was asking Jesus, what in the world are you doing? Jesus wasn't primarily letting Jairus' daughter die. Jesus was letting Jairus walk through something that would show Jairus very clearly who Jesus was. Not just a miracle worker, not just a healer, but as Lord Almighty, supreme even over death. When you wonder, God, what in the world are you doing? Here's what I would submit to you. Perhaps in so many cases, it's, he's letting you walk through something because he wants to show you exactly who he is. And so here's where that leads us. There's three takeaways I have for us this morning. The first is this. Jesus doesn't guarantee us a certain outcome, but he does promise to show us who he is in the process. 
Jesus does not promise to give us a different outcome, guys. And I know there are some really bad TV preachers who will tell you something different. But guys, Jesus does not promise you perfect physical health, and he does not promise that you'll be wealthy, and he does not promise that you will have an easy life that you go through and everything is hunky-dory and and unicorns and skittles and rainbows and woohoo. He doesn't promise us that. He doesn't promise he'll fix your marriage. He doesn't promise that he'll heal you your sickness. Now, if you're in Christ, he does heal you on the other side of eternity, and that's guaranteed. But he doesn't guarantee that he'll fix every single little detail in our life that is not perfect. But he does promise to show us exactly who he is in the moment. And you know why he does that? Because what we think we need is not necessarily what we need. It's not what we need, it's who we need. And who we need more than anything else is Jesus. At the end of the day, what Jairus needed more than anything was not for his little daughter to come back to life. And having, and as a parent who has lost a kid through miscarriage, that is difficult for me to wrap my mind around. And there are still some times, almost four years later, where I weep and wish our first was here. But that's not the thing that I need most. What I need most is to have a deeper understanding of who God is. That's what we need. Because guess what? No matter, even if you got that thing that you wish was fixed, even if you got it fixed in the moment, guess what? There will be a countless number of other things in life that go off the rails. But Jesus never goes off the rails. And he's constant and he's unchanging. In fact, the second idea is this. The certainty of Jesus is greater than the uncertainty of the moment. Why? Because of who he is. In fact, Peter, writing in a letter later in Scripture, actually describes Jesus as an anchor for the soul. When I think of anchor, what I think of is this. Uh, My parents got a case in a trampoline for Christmas or whatever, which they don't tell you takes like three people to put together. It's a glorious sanctifying process or whatever. Um, but, I, but I was talking about that, and, and Pastor Mark said, you should probably get some trampoline anchors to hold that thing down. And I did, and I'm so thankful I did, because where we live, is like a wind tunnel. But with those trampoline anchors, guess what? The trampoline stays right there. Well, guess what, guys? Here's the thing. Life is going to be chaotic at times. Life is going to be painful at times. Life will be uncertain at times. There will be so many moments where you don't know what's going to happen, and you're not really all that sure what in the world Jesus is up to. Guess what? Jesus is still certain, and he is solid, and he is the rock that we can stand on. And you know how we know this? We know this because of the resurrection. That's how we know all this. We don't trust good ideas and we don't follow Jesus because he taught nice things. We follow Jesus because he died on the cross, was buried, and then came back to life after he promised he would do it. And in my opinion, if you can predict your death and resurrection, you're pretty reliable. So the disciples 2,000 years ago, they're in this moment where they're disappointed by Jesus, the one they felt was the Savior of the world, the Messiah, allowed himself to be arrested, to be tortured, to be flogged, to be nailed to a cross, and then die. After after they knew he was the Messiah, do you think they might have felt a little disappointed by Jesus in the moment? Discouraged by Jesus? Absolutely. Absolutely. But Jesus wasn't letting them walk through that just so they could be disappointed. It was so they could know beyond the shadow of a doubt who he was because without the crucifixion, guess what? There's no resurrection. Without the resurrection, there is no Christian faith. But three days later after he died, Jesus got out of the tomb, appeared to his disciples. And guess what? Jesus didn't even guarantee a certain outcome to the disciples because the disciples were like, great, hey, awesome. Are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus, in so many words, basically says no. Do you think they may have been a little disappointed then? They're like, you mean we're going to continue under the oppression of 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 this Roman Gentile government. They're going to continue to take advantage of us and kill our people. And Jesus is like, yes, but guess what? 
Your job is not for this other certain goal. Your job is to live for me. It's to go and be my witnesses. And the disciples gave their lives for Jesus, not because they were promised a certain outcome, but because of who Jesus showed himself to be. And that was Lord Almighty and God and Savior. And because they knew, even though they would walk through times where they would be persecuted, where they would be tortured, where they would even be killed, where their families would be killed, guess what? They knew the certainty of Jesus was greater than the uncertainty of the moment. And that's the same truth we need to understand today. The certainty of Jesus is greater than the uncertainty of the moment. Not because of anything he said and taught, but because of what he did, which was come back to life. And that proves he is God and unchanging and is exactly who he says he is. And it doesn't matter what you walk through. He can be the rock that you you stand on that does not move so here's where that ultimately leads us the last idea is this I will trust who Jesus is and not what I see think or feel I will trust who Jesus is not what I see think or feel and here's where that starts it starts the moment you step out of your sin and step into a relationship with Christ and surrender your life to Jesus Salvation is the starting point for this. Because because here's what happens. Before we come to know Jesus, the only thing we're really left with is one of two things. Either we're living in blatant rebellion against God, running from Him, looking to things like pleasure and money and anything else to make us happy. Or we're trying this little works-based lifestyle where we're like, well, I just need to do things and make God happy. Here's the thing, guys. You will never find life in anything other than Jesus. And it doesn't matter how hard you work or how good a person you try to be, you will never be good enough for God. But the good news is you don't have to be. Because Jesus was good enough, not just good enough, Jesus was perfect in our place. He lived the life we couldn't live and died the death we should have lived or should have died and then came back to life three days later so that through him and him alone, we could come back to God, we could be saved, and we could be completely changed from the inside out. Here's the question I have for every single one of us in this room this Easter. Has that happened to you? Has that happened to you? And you say, well, why does that matter? It matters because every single one of us in this room, we will spend eternity somewhere. You are an eternal being. You are created for eternity. You might have been created in a moment, but you will exist forever in one of two places, either in the presence of God in heaven or separated from God in hell. And that is not meant to scare you. It is just a reality to let you know about. And the only thing that makes a difference in where you spend eternity is whether or not you stepped into a relationship with Christ. So I want to challenge every single person in the room for a second. I want to challenge, especially if you're here and you grew up in church, I want to challenge your assumption that you're saved. And I want us to ask a few questions. How do I know I'm a Christian? How do I know that I've been saved? Well, first off, I would say this. Have you ever confessed your sin? What does that mean? It means you recognize you're not a good person. You might say, that hurts. I know. I'm not a good person at the end of the day. Have you recognized that you're a sinner? Why is that so important? Because until you're convinced of your own sin, you will never be convinced that you need a Savior. You'll be convinced, I can do it my own. And guys, that's just not the case. Have you confessed your sin? Have you told God you're sorry? Have you placed your trust in Jesus to save you? Not in your works, not in your effort, but have you placed your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ through his life, his death, and resurrection? And have you said, man, based on that, Jesus, I'm trusting you to save me? But the third question is this. Does your life reflect the fact that he's Lord? Because Paul writes this in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But here's the reality, guys. A life that has confessed Jesus as Lord, really as Lord, is going to be a life that reflects his lordship. So if you're here today and, man, you've prayed the prayer or whatever, and yet your life looks just like the life of somebody not following Jesus, except for maybe the fact that you showed up at church today, man, I want to challenge the assumption that Jesus Christ is Lord because a changed life is evidence of new life. 
And there are some of you in here this morning, man, you think you've got new life, but you haven't been changed. Guys, if you haven't been changed, it's because you haven't been made alive by Jesus and Jesus is calling you home today. But this is where it starts. This is where trusting Jesus starts. And it's not based on what he taught. It's based on who he is. And he proved himself to be God and Lord by coming back to life. And that ratified everything he ever said. And he said that he was the only way back to God. Not your works, not through a priest, not through confirmation, not through baptism, but through him and him alone. So I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. And the question is very simple. Have you been saved? Have you given your life to Christ? Because here's the reality. It doesn't matter what else you're going through. I'm not minimizing it, but the truth of the matter is this. There's nothing that we go through in this world that even remotely compares to the fact that eternity is coming. And could it be that the reason Jesus is letting you walk through what you're walking through right now, in this moment, in this season, is so he could have you right here so you could hear, hey, yes, you're going through pain, you're going through discouragement, you're going through disappointment, but right here in this, right in this moment, Jesus is telling you, I am life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and guess what? I'm going to redeem that pain you're experiencing right now. I'm using that pain to put you in this moment so you can come home to me so you can confess your sin repent of your sin and give your life to Christ so if that's you in this moment this morning you need to give your life to Jesus I want to give you the opportunity for you to do that right where you sit you just simply say Jesus I'm so sorry for my sin I can't save myself. And I humble myself today and ask you to save me. And Jesus, today, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. And I confess you as Lord. And I will go wherever you tell me to go and I will do whatever you tell me to do regardless of the cross from this moment. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed this morning and nobody looking, if that was you, would you just slip your hand up real quick? If that was you this morning, you gave your life to Christ. And I will say this, if if you're here and you're like, man, I I feel like maybe I should, but I've got some questions. Um, Man, it's okay to ask questions, and I'll be around afterwards. Mark will be around afterwards. But but I would but I'd also say this and encourage you with this. Um, man, don't don't miss this moment. Don't miss this moment. If the Lord is calling you home, if the Lord is calling you to Himself, don't worry about what other people think. Listen, when Jairus's daughter was dying, he didn't worry about what other people thought. He just went to Jesus. Don't worry about who what what whoever you came here with thinks. Just respond to Jesus. He'll be faithful. Now, if that was you this morning, I'm going to actually challenge you to do something really bold. If that wasn't you this morning, um, but this applies, then then, um, what we're about to do here in a second is we're going to celebrate baptism. And baptism does not save you. Baptism is just your first step after, after salvation. And so if you've never been baptized by immersion after salvation, because that's the way they do it in the Bible, then um, we want you to get baptized today. And you might say, well, I don't have clothes. We have clothes for you. So there's no excuse. And so in just a second, we're going to stand and folks are going to go out, those that have signed up to be baptized. And when they stand or during this song, if you need to be baptized or if you gave your life to Christ today, um, in scripture, those who gave their life to Christ, man, they responded immediately by going public with baptism. If that's you, I just want to invite you to get out of your seat during this song and head out the doors. And, um, and man, there will be people there waiting for you to talk to you about t- baptism and counsel you through that decision. Uh, but we'd love to give you that opportunity this morning. The last thing I'll say is this before I pray and we stand and sing. Um, man, don't let this moment leave. Go, go by without making a decision. God brought you here for this moment.
so he could do something that you didn't even anticipate, which is draw you.